Hello and welcome to the 84 Million Podcast. It is episode 16 today. And um, we have as our guest, Mr. Crypto Anthony. Um, Anthony has been in Bitcoin since 2013. He's the party responsible for bringing the Ordinals protocol to Litecoin. Uh, and this protocol he continues to maintain. And as of April 27th, he activated the Runes protocol also on Litecoin. Uh, Anthony created the LTC20 indexing platform and minting platform Lightscribe, and he can be found on X at Anthony on Chain. So, Anthony, welcome to the show. G'day, how are you? Good morning. Uh, we're in two different places on planet Earth, but we made it work. Uh, good morning, good evening. Uh, indeed, <laughs> good morning. We're glad to have you here, and um, I'm really excited about our topic today. I think. This show has talked about ordinals, uh, tokens to a degree since launch. I think even episode one, um, it was mentioned because this show uh, was born in an environment on Litecoin or on ordinals within Litecoin. And uh, yet we've never talked to you and you're the guy. So really excited about our conversations today. Um, so let's see, ordinals, runes and fungible tokens on Litecoin. Uh, this is our task today. We're grateful to have you here. Um, you brought this ecosystem to Litecoin. Um, the most recent development would be, of course, Runes, uh, which activated, I think, about two weeks ago, uh, maybe a little more than that now. And uh, I'd like to unpack these today uh, with you. So uh, you've changed Litecoin forever. And uh, you did this essentially alone, uh, albeit on top of the work of Casey Rotermore. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so Casey did the groundwork for me. All I did was respond to Indigo's bounty and fork what Casey had already worked on um, and brought it all to Litecoin. And I guess I got to thank Casey for his initial work um, and Indigo for the bounty he put together. Otherwise, uh, we, we wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have done it. I probably wouldn't have been motivated enough to have done it in the first place. Yeah, well, it, it's it's certainly interesting, and uh, there's different opinions on it. There have always been different opinions on this, uh, and we'll get a little bit into maybe those opinions in a little bit. But uh, either way, you you did port um, all of this to Litecoin, and uh, it's pretty crazy because it has changed Litecoin forever. Um, we can do things now on Litecoin that we can never do before. And of course, Casey did initially prove this on Bitcoin, but you brought it to Litecoin. Um, was that a public bounty that Indigo had or was it private with you? Or I can't really remember if that was. Because so, he launched, I think he launched Lightspace, the official campaign after Ordinals already were on Litecoin. Yes. So the bounty was a public bounty he posted um, on his uh, Twitter page and I stumbled across it um, after I got familiar myself, I f familiarized myself with all of the Bitcoin ordinals that were going on first. I stumbled upon this bounty and realized, yes, it can be done on Litecoin. Uh, there just has to be minor change to the um, Rust open source projects that Casey started as well as some other other things um but yeah it came all came together i pretty much programmed it in within a week and inscribed the first ordinal which was the mweb uh, white paper mm -hmm. um and yeah it, it almost seems like ancient history now because it's been over a year um uh, it the time's fl uh, flown by and now we have runes. Um, between the activation of runes on Bitcoin and Litecoin, it was very, it was the Bitcoin halving, I believe, as it activated there. And then again, here, I want to say at least where I was living, April 27th in the evening, I think it was around 8.30 or 9.30 at night. Uh, so uh, runes to Litecoin was brought over very swiftly. How long were ordinals? on um bitcoin before you brought them to litecoin with that bounty um i want to say it was a month it was 
so long ago. I don't even remember now. Yeah. The time's gone so fast and so many things have happened. But I think it was about a month. And yeah, with runes, like you said, it was just over a week or it might have been a bit less than a week. I tried to launch it at the same time as Bitcoin, but uh, software-wise, it wasn't wasn't ready. Yeah, wow. I mean, this stuff happens quickly. Bitcoin has ordinals. Bitcoin has um, Bitcoin tokens or uh, BRC20 tokens or perhaps BTC20 tokens. Uh, and then, of course, runes. So why do we bring these to Litecoin? Well, Litecoin, I think, is a better platform for these ordinals. Bitcoin, it's kind of slow and clunky. You have a block every 10 minutes or so. Litecoin, there's enough space on chain. There isn't really much congestion. You have two and a half minute blocks. Um, things move uh, rapidly compared to Bitcoin. And I think for these protocols that are kind of testing the limits of these blockchains, it's probably best suited for um, chains, chains with uh, more capacity. Um, but obviously not everyone has seen that. It's definitely not as popular as what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin has probably 99% of the volume in the entire ordinal space. Um, and I don't see that changing anytime soon, <laughs> unfortunately, but that's just how things are. Even with their block limitations, you don't see that changing? Um, over the long term, there's infinite block block space, so people can inscribe at mm -hmm. their leisure. They can do it in a week or so, but most people want their projects on Bitcoin. Um, but maybe things will change. Maybe some uh, good developers will launch their projects like Luke has on Litecoin. And I guess I'm grateful that he did that to draw attention to Litecoin. Um, in a bigger fashion than most other projects that just come mint a few things and disappear he stayed around um, and helps develop the space mm -hmm. yeah i mean there's no doubting that or arguing that bitcoin is is king in a lot of these developments i mean we're bringing things after the fact and that's been the case for a while between the coding or the code base of litecoin coming from bitcoin and and we've often um, taken things from Bitcoin. Uh, I always like when we say, you know, Bitcoin coders and Litecoin coders are the same. You can open up Litecoin core and it'll say the Bitcoin developer is the Litecoin developer. So I always like to uh, remember that, you know, and I like to share that with maximalists too. And they don't like to hear it, but, you know, it's, it's very similar protocol, right? Um, it's a similar blockchain, albeit with some differences. And uh, of course, Litecoin has some advantages. Like you said, it's faster. You know, the blocks are more frequent uh, in terms of time. Don't have to wait as uh, wait as long. Of course, we have MWeb now. Um, uh, we proved that certainly first. Um, I don't see Bitcoin adopting it, although um, who knows? Um, but we're we're very similar. But there's there's no question that Bitcoin is king in many 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 ways, and and they are the premium kind of projects. However, that's going to price a lot of people out. Um, if you want to go and and play around with ordinals and and some sort of sandbox system, it's not going to be Bitcoin unless you just have a lot of Bitcoin. And I think that's becoming more difficult for people to, I guess, uh, uh, it. it Bitcoin with the price going up as it's gone up in the past few years, uh, despite dips, it's a lot more expensive than it's ever been. Fees are more expensive than they've ever been. So you have to really have a lot of resources to just quote, maybe mess around with ordinals uh, on Bitcoin, right? Uh, when Litecoin, it's a lot cheaper to do that. Um, so I think that's a big advantage and we'll see what happens in, in time because I do think um, and I'm not the only one in our community that thinks this, that, you know, Litecoin is the perfect substitute for Bitcoin. Um, if you like the Bitcoin experience, you're going to get it with Litecoin and it's going to be a little bit better. So um, that's a good point you make about infinite blocks, right, going forward. And if you adjust your, quote, time preferences, you can get your ordinal in. But I don't know how much you're going to pay. Uh, and that would be interesting if <laughs> Bitcoin becomes just a, a inscription minting service versus a money. Um, but I guess time will, will tell, but uh, um, we'll have to see.
but interesting point. I, I appreciate your response to that question. Um, I think it's important. You know, if we have it on Bitcoin, why do we need to duplicate it here? Well, I think there's good reason to do that, and uh, and we have it. So um, let's just go maybe back to basics. Um, again, we've talked about ordinals. We've talked about tokens on this show, but we've not really laid them out systematically. I hope we can do that today. I don't know if we will, but um, you're the guy to go to. So uh, I'm going to try. So ground floor, baseline stuff, definitions, uh, structuring. I understand that ordinal, instri uh, ordinal inscriptions are, are basically meta features to layer one Litecoin. Similarly, LTC20 tokens are meta features to inscriptions, right? Runes are an expansion even further, and we want to talk about that today because those are brand new. Um, despite the, mayor, uh, the meta layering, these are all layer one or on-chain Litecoin, correct? Yes. So these are all layer one. Um, so the inscription and the data itself is all layer one. Uh, what isn't layer one is the indexing. That is not layer one. The indexing follows specific rules similar to the way, uh, I guess, blocks are approved in mine, but uh, in a kind of lesser fashion. Um, and so uh, essentially um, what the indexer does is give us um, this book to read and we can find out where inscriptions live and which sats they are linked to and um those sorts of things um, it, if you want me to dive in deeper just yeah, let me know please yeah. do i don't know if i can follow you but please do <laughs> um what is the indexer is that the org client or what what's the indexer yes so the indexer is the org client and when when you make an inscription for the first time um it goes through uh this type root address and you inscribe it into um, this script's part of the transaction and that's stored um, on the blockchain and it's immutable. You can't change it, um, but it lives in that transaction that happened when it happened. And what the indexer does is tracks the particular sats that the inscription was inscribed on and it keeps tabs of that sat as it moves around. So the inscription isn't moving around, the sat is moving in the round, and the indexer um, tells you uh, which inscription that sat is linked to. Okay. My question would be, I never downloaded the ORD client. Um, to hold, uh, let's say an inscription you don't need to, from my experience, and I imagine the wallets like uh, Stack Wallet, for example, uh, renders these things um, within their wallet interface. They would they would be referencing that client on their end. Is that right? Yeah, they would go through some sort of ORD API to pull those images from um, some address lookup or UTXO lookup. So, so I guess my question would be, it sounds like they're permanent. I've done experiments where I've put them into MWeb, like an, an inscription and pulled it out. It was successful. Now, the question is, if I would have left in, the, in there longer, would I have actually gotten it out? Under the circumstances and the test that I performed, I was able to get it out. So I didn't know if like the image, uh, however these inscriptions are put on the Latoshi, if that would be scrubbed in any way or disconnected, it wasn't. So it seems like they're pretty durable. Except does that mean they're durable as long as ORD clients are running? Because what if all of the instances of the ORD client were turned off globally, period? Would we still be able to uh, experience these inscriptions or is that is that a vulnerability? Because we wouldn't be able to read them, right? Um, you wouldn't be able to read them in a way that would be user-friendly. You could still look at the data on the blockchain and see that there's a bunch of bytes that form some sort of file, whether it be an image or a PDF or text file, JSON file, mm -hmm. it'd still be there. Um, so when you create the inscription for the first time, whatever block it was inscribed in is where it lives. 
it doesn't move around it is just tracked as a sats or a latoshi um by the indexer and that's what's keeping track of it okay so when you move when you move it into like um mweb uh mweb is basically a pool of litecoin that moves every single block um to a new address and when you peg in your litecoin goes to the top of the pool and when you peg out you pull litecoin off the top of the pool so ord would be keeping track of the sats going in and the sats going out um which is why when you pegged in and pegged out into mweb you're still able to um Oh, well, you were able to find your inscription. Yeah, I was... We, that... No, that makes sense. We were wondering if it... Okay, yeah, so it's durable. Um, I think that's what I was trying to... We didn't know, because um, all yeah. of this was very new, and even uh, David Burkett didn't, didn't entirely know uh, how the inscription, I guess, how they were working at the time uh, when they were brand new. Um, and he's, he's criticized ordinals to a degree. Um, uh, but we just didn't know. So I, I sent one in, I pulled it out. It was a success. I was able to render it. Uh, there's a thread I have somewhere on X where I kind of go through it with screenshots. Uh, maybe I'll throw that in the show notes, but, um, they're, they're they are durable. Um, but it's just, if I would have left that in longer or somebody else, when they pulled out may have actually gotten that ordinal so that's the part where we can't control when we're in mweb but it didn't harm the actual inscription it's just whether or not i would have ended up lotterying that away if we would have kept it there and over a longer period of time and someone else for example requested to peg out um instead of me you know um well that interesting um do you want to say anything more about the org client it sounds like my my initial question it's extremely unlikely, but even if all the org clients were off, it's not like it, you'd erase ordinals. You just wouldn't render them the same way. They'd still be there. We just wouldn't read them. Yeah, it'd be similar to um, the text in the first block on Bitcoin and Litecoin. It's still there. You just can't read it easily. Okay. So it's other thing. So can you tell us what exactly because we never defined it on the show. What exactly is ordinal theory? Uh, how would you define it? Uh, are ordinals and inscriptions synonyms or are ordinals a specific type of inscri inscription, whereas runes are another type of in inscription? So kind of bundled the question for you there, but uh, what's ordinal theory? And while I assume certain terms are the same thing, I might be wrong. And I, I guess I'm asking you to clarify. Yeah. So ordinal theory is the theory in which, um, I guess Casey came up with it, that every sat can be tracked throughout its entire lifetime, whether it's moves from one input to a hundred outputs, each of those sats, oh, Latoshis, um, will be able to be tracked from the block they are minding through to where they currently are now. Um, and that forms the basis of the old client. So the old client tracks each sat um, explicitly from the block yours mind in. And um, it allows um, anyone to associate data with that ordinal um, sat. So you can inscribe data onto that sat and have it tracked through its existence. And it will, it will never disappear unless it's lost in a wallet and can't be accessed but um yeah it's tracked from input to output um whether it be inputs to another another utxo or into block fees it's tracked there as well okay um so i guess that term the ordinal is the the method uh, the definition for the tracking of the sat through um, at, at its lifetime, and the inscription is what's placed onto an ordinal. So they they are their own terms, then. I believe so. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, they use interchangeably now, but um, that's my understanding. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I've used them interchangeably, but it sounds like they they are actually functionally different. 
correct? I believe so. Yep. Um, this whole idea about inscribing data on Bitcoin or in our case, Litecoin is interesting. We were never able to do it before. We can now do it thanks to you. Um, what do you consider inscriptions or ordinals? Um, what do you consider them to be? What's your just thoughts about them, their function? Um, I believe Casey refers to them as digital artifacts. Do you agree with that? Um, just curious. Yeah, yeah, of course. They're a way to express yourself. You can put any data onto the blockchain and it will be immutable. You can't remove it. It's there forever. So you could use it as an expression of yourself or like a political piece, um, say for whistleblower data or something like that, or to um, place a document which dictates a particular protocol um, or even like decentralized uh, websites or images can be placed on it and built from the blockchain itself. Obviously, I guess this wasn't the intention and it probably constitutes as block spam, but um, that's, I guess, another another question. It, it is another question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I want to talk about that. But these are on layer one, um, on-chain. What are the advantages of that? Versus, for the example, advantage? we had Omni Light before. Um, we still have Omni Light, but uh, that's a second layer NFT solution. Yeah, so I guess the advantages are that you only have to run one piece of software, I guess two now, but you run your blockchain, you run your Litecoin node and the indexer, and that's all you need. Um, I guess it would be the same as Omni Light. I'm not familiar too much on how that technically works. Um, but you don't need much tooling and it's easy to use, it's easy to run and you can store data from one location and receive it in, in another, essentially. You've created this decentralized web, um, which I guess that's the um the what's it what's it called on ethereum that database the interplanetary file system the ipfs trying to do yeah. yes yeah yeah and so ipfs um and i don't entirely know how that works um it is on ethereum but i believe um you don't run nodes with the with ethereum at least the per the general person doesn't um but the IPFS data has got to be kept. And, and I've heard that e even though it's, let's say, uncensorable, if the content is no longer hosted, it can still disappear, right? So if you set up a IPFS whatever and it's no longer served, it, it, it's gone. That's not the case with ordinals um, or these inscriptions um, because it lives on chain. Yes, it's a step ahead. It's all on chain. You can't remove it. It's there forever. Because I think some of the Ethereum and even OmniLite, um, when, we were, when we were doing OmniLite M NFTs, um, oftentimes it was like an IPFS image in, like stored on an OmniLite, um, stored on the layer, what we call it. Some of them were tokens. I mean, um, but like if I have my NFT that I got, it's the image, but it's not actually on Litecoin. It's just pointing to IPFS and... So what I mean is it's kind of a two part to get your product. Um, so if, if the IPFS ever stopped hosting it, then well, you've got a, you've got a point that goes to nothing. So I think that's a big advantage of, of uh, an inscription on layer one is it's, it's all there all the time with the exception of if all the org clients were turned off and you couldn't render them, but it's still there. You can't, you can't uh, detether it. Exactly. It's um, definitely, one advantage, uh, I guess the disadvantage would be that you can't store large amounts of data. Um, but I don't think we need to store large amounts of data. I think, well, maybe people want to, but I don't think they should. And that is a reason for 
a reason against like um, ordinals um, for the block spam that occurs as a byproduct of inscribing on the blockchain. Yeah. Do you do you agree um, with these opinions that um, ordinals are actually block spam? Um, yes and no. I think they can be used in a way that um, they're expressive as art or um, either politically or something like that. But yes, they can be quite spammy, especially with uh, like um, protocols that are inefficient, uh, which I would say LTC20 would be one of them where you're just using the inscription once and basically throwing it in the bin um, after you've created a transaction with a LTC 20 transfer um, inscription. So yes, they can be ugly and a waste of space on the blockchain, but in some aspects they can be, uh, I guess they can live equally on the blockchain with other transactions. If there's a unique game, for instance, or some CCO work that has been commissioned. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of um, controversial, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. And I don't want to be the gatekeeper of it. People can do what they want. <laughs> Well, it sounds like even Casey uh, had some, I don't know if reservations is the right word, but it sounds like he's not a big fan of, of most of what's going on in crypto generally. And he's not a fan of what's being minted or, or inscribed generally, yet he still brought it to uh, Bitcoin to bring that activity to Bitcoin. And his, I guess his argument is, hey, if they're, if they're going to be supporting uh, these transactions on Bitcoin will expedite the the fees rising. We need to get used to that anyway because things are only getting more scarce. Um, so to him, it was worth it, I guess. And um, you know, but but he, he's called these NFTs and fungible tokens unsavory. That's a quote. Uh, he called them ugly or stupid, ugly wastes of time and space. And that actually sounds a lot like uh, David Burkett. Um, the MWeb developer who was our first show guest. And again, that was in the environment of Ordinals. It was brand new at the time when we interviewed him and he was very much against it. And um, personally, he's not trying to control any other human on the planet or anything like that. But personally, he's like, no, it's blog spam. Block spam. I would say blog spam. Block spam. You know, uh, it's filling up our nodes and, you know, competing with other money-based transactions. And, you know, he wasn't a big fan of it. So, um, I think that's interesting. And it sounds like you can go both ways on that as well. Yeah, of course. Obviously, I, I definitely agree with some of those, those opinions. Um, in his case, he built a tool that was probably going to be built anyway. Um, in the long term, people were going to figure out that maybe an ordinals type theory would be the best way to track sats and you could inscribe on them and inscribe lots of data and fill up the blocks with spam um, and make it super expensive for normal transactions to get through. But in the end, um, this is just all game theory. This was going to happen anyway. And um, um, <laughs> there's not much we can do. Block space is limited. Uh, it's limited per 10 minute increments. Um, and yeah, <laughs> um, it's obviously not beneficial to crypto as a whole because you don't want to price people out with these enormous transactions. $30 is a lot to some people in other countries. Um, they could probably live off that for a month. Um, and people in the Western world just throw it away um, to miners. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I do agree with, with those opinions that it is unsightly some of the time but it can also be beneficial and let's be honest it was going to happen there's going to be 
basically what people are saying a block space war with um normal transactions that when you've when the protocol's been designed to have a limits uh, it's going to hit it and we need to work around these solutions and i don't want to be the one to have the um uh, come up with a solution for what needs to be done um other people smarter than me are going to do that but um yeah when you have a decentralized system you need to choose between scalability and security um as well as decentralization obviously you could go to a centralized system and be much faster and you could store as much data as you want but that's not the whole um idea behind cryptocurrency it's uh, a monetary vehicle where you can send money or a form of money from one side of the earth to the other without a middleman it's true there's a lot of <laughs> kind of things I wanted to pick out of that. Um, the pricing people out of Bitcoin, I think, yeah, initially we were talking about the third world unbanked populations. Um, and this is a departure from our general topic, by the way. Um, but it's part of what I see as the problem of maximalism. Now, maybe this was inevitable anyway, and we're just expediting it um, because game theory, et cetera. Um, but, you know, in the early days, it was get your coffee with Bitcoin and, you know, these smaller payments can be done on Bitcoin and Bitcoin was pretty cheap to send. Now it's not the case anymore. And uh, so I'm wondering what the prospect is for Bitcoin actually helping, uh, you know, underdeveloped nations or populations. It, it doesn't look like that's the coin that I would suggest they use um, if they have a hundred dollars of value and have to move a portion of it and, you know, extinguish 25 or more percent of it just for the transaction fee doesn't really make sense. Um, but maybe this was inevitable the whole time. Um, but we don't have that on Litecoin yet, which is another um, case I have in favor of, of course, Litecoin, is it is still very cheap to transact in extremely large volumes. Um, and it's still um, a lot cheaper to um, you know, mint, um, the, these sort of things that we're talking about and, and transfer them and we're not filling up blocks. Now that could change a uh, week. We, if all of the Bitcoin blocks are filled, I believe some of that will trickle to us. It's already happening. Um, if you look at BitPay in terms of what people are choosing to use as, as uh, money, cryptocurrency, they're not using Bitcoin as cryptocurrency, uh, in most cases, um, they're using Litecoin a lot more and that makes sense. So I don't want to say it's impossible for us to get to the point where Bitcoin is, um, but we're definitely not there at this point. Um, so I think despite the block, um, the block spam, despite the degening <laughs> of JPEGs on, on, on chain, right? Um, it seems that Litecoin infrastructurally uh, is handling it pretty well. Would you, would you agree with that? Definitely. Litecoin has a lot of room to grow at the moment in terms of its usage. Um, and I would expect to maybe reach capacity, full capacity like Bitcoin has with one gigabyte mempool um, in probably within maybe four to 10 years, mm. I would say, at this current rate. I don't think it's quite there yet. But we will definitely get there and it will need to be a problem that needs to be solved. Otherwise, we're going to have one expect it's, uh, like huge, um, uh, hugely expensive fees on one, one coin just going to another and then it's going to another again and again. Um, and that's not what we want. <laughs> we want to eventually reach a solution that's going to work. Um, but I'm not sure if there is one. Mm. Maybe. <laughs> uh, well, they that's when they propose the layering, right? Yes. So you go from layer one to layer two. Yeah. Um, which will definitely n be required. Yeah. I think so too. Um, and that's why I, as much as there have been issues with the lightning network and its lack of delivery and the promise. Um, I still think we're going to 
use second layers like lightning and hopefully they, they continue to improve and I've heard the criticisms and, you know, get better, right? That's the whole point, right? We talk about it so we can not abolish it, at least in my opinion, but to make it better and, and do what it needs to do. Um, so, so the future probably is layering with, with finite assets, but, um, you know, if you consider if all of human exchange is put onto these platforms or these blockchains, um, so t time will tell. I'm not an enemy of layering. I do prefer on chain. I think that was the original model and should be used. Um, but you know, does it have to be, do we have to be on chain for every single transaction all the time? Probably not. Uh, but the good news is we, we get to have that experience on Bitcoin and Litecoin, you can still have it on Bitcoin. It just costs a lot more. Um, and the newer folks coming on board are not going to have what maybe Bitcoiners back 10 years ago or even five years ago experienced, right? Um, but the Litecoin community still can operate on chain um, very well, very easily and very affordably. So that's interesting you put a time on that. I never kind of sat down to consider you know when when will we match for example what what bitcoin is experiencing so you're saying did you say seven to ten years or, or something like this i think it was four to ten years i said four to ten years um what do you see litecoin looking like let's say in four years if that were to occur what's a fee are we still looking at a penny or less i th i think it would be maybe 10 cents if we're reaching block space capacity mm -hmm. per block um, but no more than that, unless the price significantly increase, um, which I'm not an oracle for the price. I don't know what it's going to do tomorrow. I don't know. Don't even know where it is today. I haven't looked. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I haven't either. It's, 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 it's that early. I haven't pulled my cell phone out to look. <laughs> the Litecoin podcast and the Litecoin, you know, uh, both the host and the guest are unaware of the price at Litecoin at this very moment. Unbelievable, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. These are bigger picture things, but um, I think the price will continue to do well. But I mean, if if we're still dealing with a ten per, uh, ten cent transaction fee, that's a lot higher than now, but that's still very cheap. Um, so that actually sounds like. You know, in the, in that time frame, that may not be the worst thing because I'm thinking if we're having a 10 cent fee on our Litecoin, what what does Litecoin the price look like in four years? It's it's probably going to be higher. That's that's I'll, that's I'll all I will say. <laughs> <laughs> so even it's basically programmed. <laughs> it's basically programmed exactly. It is a finite asset over time in an in an environment of unlimited inflation. Um, so maybe. Uh, we go to LRC20 tokens. I call them LRC because of ERC, right? And I, I believe I had a conversation at, well, I did have a conversation. That's not the question. Luke was on the show episode four and he he was uh, instrumental in that protocol on Litecoin. However, is it LRC20 or is it LTC20? I've heard both. So Luke coined the term LTC20 and he told me the reason why he did this instead of LRC and it was because uh, Loopering which is a I guess a layer 2 for Ethereum um, is uh, symbology is LRC and he didn't want it to be confusing so he called it LTC20 okay. and the, L the RC in ERC, BRC stands for request for comment. And it's a, I guess, a protocol of um, something that they put on their GitHub or whatever, and they talk about it and see if they want to implement it into the protocol. But that's basically it. How would you describe the LTC 20 standard? Um, it's a bit bloaty. I don't particularly like it. Um, I think it, is kind of rushed um, and unusable as like a token vehicle um, just because there are a few steps involved. Firstly, you need to inscribe um, the, the token itself and you need to be the first, it comes on a first uh, principle basis. So you need to be the first one to inscribe um, the token and then you need to mint it and you 
need another indexer to even index this and keep track of all these tokens as well as the inscriptions. So yes, it is a meta layer on top of ord um, top of ordinals. Um, and then when you want to transfer the inscription, you need to create a transfer inscription, which transfers the value that you have in your balance to this inscription and send it to another address. Um, and those, that extra step complicates things. Um, when I was working on Lightscribe, I built an indexer. And I don't know if you have heard the controversies behind it, but I guess I didn't do a good job at some points. It's since been fixed, but at that time, um, there were a lot of tracking issues with the balances um, with those L LTC20 tokens. And I tried my best to fix it. Obviously, I'm working full time, so I can't dedicate a huge amount of resources to getting this thing working perfectly like uh, the Bitcoin guys can. Um, but yeah, um, it, tokens haven't taken off on Litecoin um, and it's probably due to the lack of development among other things. How are the, the BTC uh, 20 tokens? Are they being used a lot? I mean, I'm not sure if you have intelligence. Uh, I, I'm not following anything there. Have they really taken off and people are using these um, pre-runic tokens uh, on-chain Bitcoin? Uh, definitely. They are very speculative. Um, so I don't think anyone is using them for any serious means or uh, whether they have utility or not. I can't comment on that. I don't think they do. Um, but yeah, they seem to be performing well price-wise and volume-wise on Bitcoin um, with over hundreds of millions in volume a day mm. um, on some of these centralized um, exchanges. But that doesn't have seemed to flow down to the altcoin ecosystem such as Litecoin. I think for me, I've used Ethereum tokens, right? And um, the user experience there was good. Like if you had some Ethereum based token, it still behaved like a divisible token, right? Um, and that's where I've had a hard time. And it could be because I don't have the infrastructure set up on my end. Um, and to be honest, I didn't put a lot of time in getting any infrastructure. Like I said, I don't have the org client or anything else, but to me, it, it was a little bit strange um, and very different than, for example, using an Ethereum-based token or even an Omni-layer token um, because Omni-layer tokens are divisible, right? So if I created, you know, I, uh, you know a, an emoji icon and turned it into a token, right? Then I made, you know, I set a, a total uh, supply of, you know, 10 million or whatever. I could still send them in individual units, right? They were, they were divisible, not necessarily sub- divisible. I never tried to break one of those down under one. And I don't think with the way I set it up, I could actually do that with the, with the few things that I built. Um, but I was airdropped um, an LTC 20 token, I think through labs, Litecoin labs who created the, the Moonbirds and they got a few Moonbirds uh, inscriptions. And then um, I think they airdropped labs tokens to holders, right? And I think it was like 2,000 labs. Um, sorry, Luke, if I'm getting your numbers wrong. <laughs> um, you know, but to me, I got it in like a single packet cluster, like single item ordinal, right? I'm calling it that. Um, even though it represented um, 2,000 labs tokens. I'm like, to me, it looks like a, a unitary item, right? Like, how do I divide this into the 2,000 pieces to send one or 2,000 of the pieces? Like, that I didn't get. And I, I know I'm not the only one with that, I guess, question. And um, so it's not very intuitive to me. So how does that even work? So if you wanted to break um, that 2,000 token bundle up, you would need to create 2,000 inscriptions and then send 
each of those to another person. That's the only way you could do it on using the LTC 20 protocol, um, which is why I think runes are much more effective and better solution for a token protocol built in a UTXO kind of um, cryptocurrency. Okay, so so I'm, so I'm not incorrect. I, my bundle was essentially a bundle and I need to do extra effort or uh, add extra effort to divide them up as I see fit. Are people doing yes. that? <laughs> I guess that's my um, question. Is anybody actually doing that? I don't think so. <laughs> it It's quite... Um, because there is so, there's a lot of steps you need to take to even send that many tokens that the tooling isn't really there to make it easy and people kind of give up. They don't really divide their tokens. Mm -hmm. If you go onto any marketplace, you'll see that they're listing just the tokens that they've been given. They don't try to divide it up. Um, because there's a bit of effort involved into splitting those and getting into smaller bundles. Okay, so I'm not the only one with these questions. Wow. So, and I'm sure, out, well, I can't be sure of anything, right? I don't know anything about tomorrow. I would imagine um, we're going to continue to improve on this protocol, the LTC20. Um, however, runes, it sounds, um, are... a uh, dramatic improvement over these um ltc20 tokens so we haven't even defined runes yet but i'm curious if they're going to eclipse them and kind of make them irrelevant or or maybe not um they'll probably live by side by side at least on bitcoin I'm not sure about litecoin i can't comment on its future or whether ltc20s will rise again um as i hope but um yeah the the runes i think are just better engineering wise software wise uh the indexer is integrated into the old client so you don't need to build your own indexer to track um the balance of these tokens around um it's quite easy casey and his team did a good job uh bringing runes to bitcoin and now litecoin so let's talk about runes i think it's time that's the the <laughs> kind of the, the central piece of our episode we've already gone 48 minutes without really defining them now's our chance um so, so this is the newest protocol on litecoin it was activated um at block two six seven five six zero zero uh, what are runes? How do they improve upon ordinals and LTC 20s? Uh, this deals with, I believe, the unspent transaction outputs, uh, UTXOs, uh, and their efficiency. And I hear something about op return. So tell, tell us about runes. So runes are yet another token protocol built on top of the ordinals ecosystem, uh, but it's a little bit different. So Ord is only used to track the etch, which contains the terms and the rules in which define the rune itself. Um, and because it's an ordinal on the etch, you can attach the image or the token image to it. Um, but all the other information is stored in the op return. And the op return um, uses uh, the scripts buffer, I suppose. And um, basically when a transaction is sent to the miner, it will see this up return and return from that. But the indexer will look at the scripts behind that up return um, and whether it aligns with the rules of the indexer for uh, the runes protocol. Um, so the way the runes protocol works is that if you wanna create a token, you etch the rules, um, which allows anyone after the block height in which that is uh, committed to the blockchain or revealed um, to mint that token. And there are limits on how many you can mint and each mint um, gets sent to a UTXO 
which contains the balance of that token. And um, then there's other rules dictating how the balance is transferred from those tokens to uh, the UTXOs to other addresses or um, other outputs of another transaction. Um, so these can be split up quite easily. You described a problem where you're trying to send 2,000. Um, you had a packet of 2,000 and you're trying to send it to 2,000 other individuals with runes. Um, it's built into the protocol. So if you specify, I think it's a zero amount when you create a transaction and you have 10 outputs, for instance, it will equally divide the inputs balance to all the output balances. So it makes it much more efficient. Um, do you have any more questions for the runes? Of course, of course I do, of course I do. I always have to look at what I have written down and then compare it with what you've shared, <laughs> you know, to kind of continually revise my questions as we as as we go along. But um, I guess it's, I guess when I heard runes were coming, I, I didn't know if it would um, improve upon ordinals or the tokens, right? And it sounds like it, it's really not, um, it's really more of a, a, a tokens protocol. Um, for example, if, if one of the former um, things would be replaced, it would be um, the LTC 20s would be kind of, like I said, eclipsed by this technology versus ordinals, because I think they're different um, in terms of why we're using these things. Um, is that correct? That this is a better token standard rather than a, a better ordinal standard? Yes, this is a better token standard built on uh, Bitcoin, Litecoin, or Dogecoin, or whatever um, UTXO model you're trying to uh, put this on. I think it will replace uh, LTC20, BRC20 in the long run. Okay. Um, it, it's just better. Um, I know there's a lot of tools out there for bitcoin so maybe it might take some time but again the ecosystem is young so it might just take a bear market to get rid of it okay um so we don't see ordinals and inscriptions and inscribing really changing a whole lot with it with this uh, new capacity to etch a rune they're just different use cases Yes, they are very different um, in functionality. So they can exist without the other. Mm -hmm. and, and I would imagine that the LTC20s and runes will, will coexist for a while too. It's just there may be a high preference to runes now that the cat's out of the bag. Um, how, how do they, well, I guess, what are the parameters? And it, I use the word standard. That might have not been an appropriate term. I believe the LTC20 is a standard. Um, but are the runes a standard too, or are there more like um, things that can be tweaked uh, based upon whoever's doing the etching? Um, so all runes follow the same sort of uh, recipe, I suppose, when you create them. So you can specify the name of the rune, which is unique and only can be uh, etched once. Um, then you can also have the supply of the rune, um, and that can be divisible down to, I think, uh, 36 decimal places. It might be less than that. I can't remember. Wow. Um, but 36 decimal places or zero, you can make um, this kind of one-off thing if you want, um, or non-divisible. Um, then you can add your symbol to the rune. So this could be either dollar sign or an emoji, um, then you can have terms for the minting. So this includes um, how many are pre-mined to a certain address. Um, so this could be your team allocation, or um, if you just want a public mint, you can kind of do, you can mix and match. Um, but then you can set the terms for the minting itself. So say you wanted to mint a rune, um, the protocol says you have can have 10 at a time. Um, and that's as much and as little as you get. You get exactly 10. Uh, and then there's also rules specifying the start's um, height and the end height of the 
rune's mintability, um, which is the period in which you're allowed to mint the rune and only between those two optional fields um, you're allowed to mint this rune and then beyond that or before that it will be unmintable. Um, so you could specify uh, a 10 block window for this rune to be minted um, and if no one mints it then there's zero supply and that's it. <laughs> but um, yeah. That's, that's, pretty, that's I think pretty that's cool. summed up all the features. Oh there's also this turbo mode. I don't know what that does. He Casey said it was for future protocol changes um, and that's an optional thing you can specify it sounds like there are a lot of options um i like the idea that you can like set a term of blocks for mintability that's that's kind of neat um yeah these are interesting and 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 i haven't done anything with these i i've kind of surveyed what's been created so far um, in fact, somebody created an 84 million rune set and I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I, I don't know the origin of that, uh, you know, rune set or the minting or the parameters or anything like that. But uh, they're, they're, they're interesting. I'm, I'm wondering which, which um, if any wallets support them. Um, I don't, um, I'm not aware of any yet. That, that, that would like, I guess, render. But then again, these aren't necessarily image based but they can be right like the rune can carry an image like an like an inscription but it's not like you have an individual non-fungible inscription right um but no, you can add so images rune, to them can't you yeah so the rune is uh, the rune image is just on the etching which defines the token and all the mints and everything else don't contain any ordinals whatsoever Okay. They're, they're just UTXOs that get moved around. Okay. How does somebody go about deploying um, runes? So I've got an idea. I want to create, you know, I've got my name. I've got my however many runes I want to launch and the parameter set. I want to have it for 10 blocks or 10,000 blocks or whatever. How, do, how does somebody go about setting this up? Do you, is there like a light scribe type feature for this? Um, or is we're just operating ORD within core? Yeah, so I think there's a bunch of services that for people without a, a Litecoin Core um, instance installed and synced, um, you can go to, I think, Ordinals Bot has one, um, Lightverse, Chicken Market, um, uh, uh, Ordinals as well, I think are the major players in the Ordinal a Litecoin Ordinals ecosystem that are developing these tools. Um, but if you want to run it yourself, your best bet is getting a Litecoin node synced up. It's only 80 gigs. And then running your Ord client on top of that, which is 20 gigs fully synced. Um, and then you, it's all command line based. There's no GUI for it, unfortunately. But you define the rules in a batch file and then you run ord client on that batch file which will do the inscription of the rune image and the etching of the um, rune token and once the six block window um, which is meant to prevent front running of certain tokens is um, elapsed then the rune itself will become publicly mintable or non-mintable if you did a full pre-mine um, for anyone to anyone to uh, mint and then use your token. Um, and that's kind of it. There isn't much more to it. <laughs> it, it, it I'm interesting, um, interested to see where all of this kind of goes. Um, you mentioned uh, Lightverse, Chicken Market, and Lord Knowles. They already have um, features built in that you can create these tokens. Um, I'm not sure about creating. <laughs> I don't think. I guess that's I what know, I meant. I how do I? How would I initiate an etch outside of Ord? Because I know, like, there were inscriptions for ordinals. There was different, um, you know, like I said, light scribe, where you could actually put your text in or your image, and it would kind of do it for you, and you'd pay the fee. Then you could kind of deploy your 
your your instance of an inscription, right? Um, I I don't I was surprised if that already existed with the short period that these runes have been live on Litecoin. So yeah, I believe the marketplaces have trading for runes, Lightverse, um, and I know Chicken Market I've seen. I haven't really looked much at the Lord Knows one, but that I guess that was my question. If you didn't have Ord, how am I setting up uh, runes okay. or minting them or creating so them? So there is one market which. I'm looking at it now. I'm trying to bring it up for you. But um, oh, what are they called? Yeah, ordinalslight.xyz. Okay. Go there. Check it out. Um, it has... So Ordinals Light is run by the same people who run Ordinals Bot on um, Bitcoin. And they have an etching tool for runes as well as minting um, and normal inscription. Um, and yeah, these guys are pretty quick at getting their tools out. So I guess once they saw that I had forked runes to Litecoin, they um, updated their site. They're not, um, they don't like post this site publicly, but it was passed around in the Discord channel. Mm. Um, and I saw a rune with their website on it as well <laughs> in the rune name. Ah, that's correct. Um, it is. It is here. <laughs> you know, I've seen this. Um, this this site's been up for a while. Um, I forgot about this site, ordinalslight.xyz. Pretty cool. So you can uh, mint runes uh, just kind of on an easy uh, interface right here. Cool. I may want to tinker with that. So no it's worries. already here in two weeks. Two. We're already doing all no. this stuff. <laughs> Pretty cool. So so I guess here's another question. Um, I'm going to go back to, again, somebody created an 84 million rune. Let's pretend I'm Google. And, you know, this was the same on Omni, Omni layer stuff, the Omni light, you know, there was all these uh, national names and, you know, uh, emojis claimed and all these kind of things that were taken up in the early days, kind of like squatter type situations, right? Yeah. I'm not calling whoever created 84 million a, sw a squatter. <laughs> But like, let, let's say like somebody did create a rune called like Google or Apple or whatever. Right. Um, and then let's say actually Google wanted to go create a, a Google rune. Like is, is this to a degree arbitrary? Like they could just set up a new one and call it Google and like, it doesn't really matter. Or like, does that specific instance would be something they would want to go claim. Like I need that Google ticker, right? Does this make sense? Yeah. So these these are rune names are unique. You can't you can't um etch another one with the same name. Once it's done, it's done. And yeah, they have it forever. You can't <laughs> you can't get it back off them unless you have access to their wallet. Okay. Um, but even then these these um etchings are public. So unless they do a pre-mine of all the tokens, um, you might be able to mint some Google token. <laughs> yeah, I, but, um... I, they it might be there. Maybe I gave somebody an, an idea. I don't know. But <laughs> I was just curious about that because I think I heard Casey saying it wasn't that significant. Like if Google wanted to create a rune, they'll just set their own parameters and create a new one and then like say, no, this is the Google rune. Like whoever set up that first one doesn't really matter. It's not actually Google. And in other words, you'd get over that point pretty quickly, but you know, obviously a name's a name. Um, and if you're the first one to get Google, I think there's something to that, right. Or, or the first one to get 84 million or whatever. Um, I, I just didn't know what your opinion was on that. Yeah. So um, for the, particular name it's first come first serve but if you want to run a business on a token and it's already taken then you have to come up with a different name that's kind of how it works okay yeah. in, in terms of explorers i've used always the ordinals light.com um that seems to have brought a lot of these runes there too are there any other explorers other than like ordinals light.com that that we know about um, there used to be one. I forget what it was called back in the day. Uh, but the ordinalslight.com uh, website is run by Indigo and 
myself. So I help maintain and update that site. Indigo is creating an alternate one too. What do you mean? <laughs> I think you released you that already. Like another Indigo? Oh, no, it was another one where it, it, it realized the pictures and um, it was just another type of explorer. Um, yeah, so that is built on, I know the one you're talking about, it's called Ordlight IO. Ordlight IO, it's, yeah. it's built on top of uh, Ordinals, the Ordinals client. So Ord ordinalslight.com is the Ordinals client as you run it locally, but served to the internet. Okay. So those are the, the places we go. I, I mean, it, it's got everything there. Um, ordinalslight.com, that's what I've I've always been used. I've always been using. Um, it's early, folks. I can't speak. Please pardon me. Um, there's a, a few more things I actually wanted to talk about in terms of the layout of Ordinals Light and kind of like when you open up an inscription. And this may pertain actually more to, uh, to inscriptions than to runes. Um, but what is the significance of a Teleburn address? An Ethereum Teleburn address, I believe it's called. Oh, uh, so this is just another feature that I ported over um, from the Ordinals platform. So anytime there's an Ordinals update, I take all the features, whatever they are, and shove them into the new binary that is for Ordinals Lite. Mm -hmm. um, at the top of the Ordinals Lite page, you can find a handy um, document link. And uh, there it describes the, let me find the Teleburn address because I don't even know what it's for, I think it's for when you want to say, for instance, burn an NFT on say Ethereum and send it to that address. And basically that inscription is the ordinal. It just becomes it somehow. Um, yeah, I think these are randomly generated addresses, but yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm not a, exactly sure that it's used very much, um, but in the documentation, it says that a teleburning an asset means something like, I'm out, find me on Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, well, well, there you have it, folks. <laughs> I, I didn't know what it was. Uh, I didn't know if it was like, oh, teleburn, it's like, like old school, like burning, you know, like that language, like from yesteryear, like, oh, you're just going to copy it to Ethereum or if it's like burned, like as in destroy, which I'm like, I didn't think we could destroy these after they were out, but maybe we can. So I didn't yeah. know what that meant. So um, it's destroying it the other way and coming to Bitcoin okay. <laughs> or Litecoin. Okay. So it will be an Ethereum based NFT that you're going to turn into an ordinal. Correct. That's what, yeah. okay. you interesting. Would, you would send it to that address. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's that's for those people that want to destroy all their Ethereum tokens. There is a way to do it, and you can come to Litecoin. Uh, I think <laughs> is it supported for Litecoin too? I mean, I imagine the entire set is supported, but I don't know. Um. Well, we need to test it. I, I'm not sure how it's indexed or tracked okay. because Ordinals doesn't look at like Ord Scan. Uh, I mean, ETH Scan or something like that to determine that some Ethereum NFT has been burnt. I don't think it has that kind of information. It's just there for other people to kind of track and interpret themselves. Okay. The other question I had uh, regarding, again, kind of the layout and some of the different things we see when we open up um, a specific ordinal and see the statistics and the different things listed on ordinals uh, light.com was uh, the, the, the sat or in our case, the lit, right? Satoshi is to Bitcoin as Litoshi is to Litecoin. Ordinals are inscribed on a Litoshi, which are typically bundled in a packet of, of other uh, Litoshis. Um, to send back and forth and to kind of buffer it, right? So you don't actually accidentally spend the ordinal in a fee or something like this. Um, that's that's my understanding of it. But, yeah, that's correct. But these um, th this concept of rare sats, or in our case, rare lits, what is this about? And can you define them for us? Like what is a common sat? 
or I'll use our language, a common lit, an uncommon lit, uh, a legendary lit. Um, wh what are these things? What are they? Uh, so the rarity corresponds to the location in a block or the epoch or something like that. So a rare sat um, could be sat zero at the start of a newly minted block or at a specific offset in that block. Um, and that's kind of just what it pertains to. Um, so you could have blocks that uh, of the halvening and they might have a specific rarity attached to them. It might be a meta rarity like they have on Ord.io where they say these sats are from the pizza delivery guy that um, was, uh, he got 10,000 Bitcoin um, because he sold a pizza to this guy that wanted to give him 10,000 Bitcoin for some reason. Um, and yeah, that's, um, I'm not very good at explaining this. I didn't come prepared, but, um, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. These, the, the rarity on Litecoin, um, I don't think it's been tracked that much compared to Bitcoin, but yeah, it just pertains to the position of that sat in a block. I'm curious if, if that will be, I mean, cause if it's on Bitcoin, we could do the same sort of, uh, identification system for Litecoin, uh, Litoshis. Um, curious, somebody should, should set that up. Um, cause the identif the identification system's already there. It's just, I guess, whether or not you want to trade them, if there's like a trading system to say, Hey, I have a legendary sat from, you know, I don't even think one of those exists yet. I think those are like every six cycles or something crazy. Uh, um, so it's the first set of each cycle. I've got the list of rarities in front of me. I'll just go through them quickly. Okay. But um, so we have the six um, rarity levels. You've got common, which is any sat that's not the first sat of its block. Uncommon, the first sat of each block. Rare, the first sat of each difficulty adjustment period. Epic, the first sat of each halvening epoch. Legendary, the first sat of each cycle. And mythical, the first sat of the Genesis block, which um, can't be moved. Hmm. I thought there was one with the difficulty cycle and the halving, which was like, like a way long time preference thing. But anyway, thank you for that. I was always curious and you just read them to us. So curious if anything like that is happening on Litecoin. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's any serious trading along those lines, but if people are interested, they can set it up. <laughs> it's yeah. like it's, just, it's like everything's about rarity, you know, now we can get into actual rare lits, which is just crazy. <laughs> just use your Litecoin people and, um, you know, ask uh, your merchants to accept it and, and offer it to uh, those you know. And, uh, you know, uh, we don't give it financial advice on the show, but just spend and replace Use your Litecoin. But of course, there's all these fun things too. So I do think they're interesting. I, I'm just not personally involved in them. Um, I do think the ordinals are cool. I, I, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens with runes, you know, as they keep unfolding as kind of a better token standard on Litecoin. I think that'll be pretty fun. Um, but where do you see, back to runes, where do you see runes in, let's say, the next uh, six months, one year, five years? Um, probably six months. We're going to be right in the middle, smack bang, in the middle of another bull run. If we haven't already passed it and we're heading into a bear market, who knows at this stage. Um, so I probably see them taking off quite well, um, whether it's on Bitcoin or Litecoin. I think both ecosystems will see some sort of uh, hype cycle associated with runes. Um, a year, we're probably still within that kind of same time frame as six months. It's a little bit too close, uh, but five years, uh, who knows? Um, just crystal ball gazing at that point, but I hope they're still around. I hope some other protocol hasn't come by or Ordinal's ecosystem has completely collapsed. I don't think that's going to be the case. It's probably going to be similar to how 
NFTs are, have evolved on um, Ethereum, but they're a little bit more robust on Litecoin, I believe, oh, on Bitcoin as well, um, where they I, IPFS doesn't go down on Bitcoin or Litecoin. You're still going to have your images, um, not JPEGs or runes even. Um, so they'll still be around and maybe someone in the future will pick them up and build an entirely new platform or gamify Litecoin with these runes and generate a whole new uh, wave of investors that want to get involved in runes or experimenters or whoever. Um, But yeah, there's a lot of things to look forward to and I hope runes stay around for more than five years. But um, yeah. A question, nice. a question, if I could. Do you know of any Bitcoin projects that are um, looking to migrate to Litecoin in terms of rune use? In terms of rune use, no. Um, I think maybe some of the smaller exchanges might want to get involved, but that's all speculatory. Um, I don't know for sure that that will even happen, but maybe some projects on Bitcoin will see that, oh, I could probably reach more people by putting it on Litecoin where the fees are low and there's loads more block space and trading is faster and cheaper than it is on Bitcoin. But um, I'm not sure what their motives would be, um, to be frank. I yeah, can't speculate on that at the moment. No worries. We'll land the plane with kind of, we've talked to a degree about uh, tokens, inscriptions, runes on Litecoin, specifically runes. Um, what have, what have I not asked you? What have I left out? What do you feel that needs to be shared that maybe we haven't covered uh, in this general domain? I think we've covered quite a bit about the whole ordinal ecosystem. I'm happy where we are. Very good. Very good. Nice. Go ahead. We're in a good space. We've, we're done. We made it. <laughs> we're in a good space. We've done. We made. Yes, here, here, and uh, a, a reminder <laughs> that um, you know you can store these in core. You can launch them within core with the Ord client. We'll put those links. Uh, in the show notes and something, this is a little bit peripheral, but the 84 million shop, uh, there's the run a node, uh, kind of collection of, uh, crew neck and, uh, a t-shirt. And we've got a few, few things in there. Just note that if you do grab any of those items, we did announce this week that we were, we're going to give a portion of each of those directly to, uh, Litecoin developers. Um, for this sort of thing, the maintenance of core and MWeb and things like that. So if you're interested in in running a node and then wearing that you run a node and kind of supporting that, um, take a look at the 84 million shop and and the proceeds will be partially diverted to Litecoin development. So I did want to want to mention that because we always talk about running nodes on this uh, um, podcast and and Lotion was on and and you've mentioned nodes here. Like it's it's a crucial part of our ecosystem and people, are, it's still everybody can participate, right? Um, and especially with runes, you can literally create them within um, Litecoin Core. Um, so get Core, use it, um, you know, add some of these add-ons and do even more um, with your client. And uh, anyway, that's all I'll say on that. Um, any, any last things you want to end with, Anthony, before we close out? Um, yeah, I guess what I want to say is thank you for having me on the show. I hope that it's helpful to uh, your audience to understand what ordinals and runes and all these things are all about on Litecoin. And obviously I want to see this Litecoin ordinals community grow. Um, pretty big stakeholder now that um, I'm dedicated to maintaining this old client forever, I guess, until Casey stops updating it. Uh, But yeah, thank you for having me. Glad to have you. I think it's a valuable resource for me and for our our listeners. Um, Thank you for all of your work and setting all of this up and 
and uh, the cat's out of the bag. So thanks for your commitment here and, and uh, bringing all this exciting stuff over to Litecoin. Um, we're happy to see all this stuff kind of the ability to build on Litecoin in new ways. Um, so uh, you're the guy. So glad to have you here. Will you be at the summit this summer? I probably won't make it to that, no. That is unfortunate, but uh, I understand there's a few occasions I didn't make it either. So, um, well, hopefully that changes, but understood if it doesn't. I but, might uh, be able to make a video call into the summit, but that's probably the extent you're not going to see me in person. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, either way, Anthony, uh, we appreciate your time. Um, Thanks, everybody, for listening and, and uh, tuning into the 84 Million Podcast. Of course, you can find all of our episodes at 84million.com slash podcast. We're on X at 84 Million, and we are on YouTube. So uh, with that being said, we will see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you.